all. This is Dr. Mobeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. This is my favorite day. This is our one-on-one. -on -one. This is our uh, open forum. And this has come after many days because with Christmas, we took an off and this day was uh, moved. Then with New Year, this day, day was moved as well. So we are meeting each other on a Friday with this for a, after a long time. So welcome, and I hope everyone is doing great, and you're safe, and you're blessed, and you're protected. Um, I wanted to share something good. Uh, here is the, um, this is the YouTube award that we got. How do I show it here? So <clears throat> this was uh, sent to us, although it is on 100,000 subscribers, and we are at uh, 240,000 subscribers. I actually never thought that I will be, uh, I didn't do this, what I'm doing here, for subscriptions or for uh, views, but this is a kind of a milestone that is interesting. So we got their silver award. So thank you to everyone for being with me during this journey. When we started in March or April, our subscri subscribers were about 136,000. And now we are at 240,000. So thank you very much. In addition to that, uh, there were about 9 million video watches during this last year. And uh, I believe that my videos are watched a little bit lesser than others for the reason of length. Even then, 9 million folks or some folks watch multiple. So a lot of lot of people watch these videos with that there have been the number of hours that were watched are equal to 136 years worth of hours one century worth of hours plus 36 more years so that 136 years worth of hours were watched in 2020 so thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much for joining me in this journey as I uh, wanted to figure out as well for what is happening and how do we save ourselves. So <clears throat> cool beans are great. Thank you very much for, for this awesome help. And thank you very much for all the coffees and all the support. There have been many of you who have supported very generously and kept me going when I focused entirely on these videos. It is actually not as simple as just showing up here and doing a video. There are many times uh, technical aspects that I have to research first, and then I have to see where is the discredited science and where is the actual science and kind of figure out the right papers which are not biased, or at least which I could figure out that they are right, and then bring them back to you. So there was a lot of work that went into it, and your support during this time has been tremendous. So thank you very much. So with this, um, let's start our discussion for today. The other thing, you may have noticed that my cough has really reduced. Yesterday, I coughed a little bit in the early part of the lecture because I was holding Luffy. Um, although we keep him groomed and everything, but his hair still caused me to cough. So somebody had asked me to ask Santa to bring a HEPA <laughs> air purifier. So I have that HEPA-based air purifier over here. It's a beautiful product, and um, it runs the whole day. And usually when I used to sit here at this table for preparation, within three, four hours, I would start coughing. And, and the reason is that Luffy and Kyrie they prefer to stay with me. So when I'm preparing, they are either sitting here or they are sitting here at my table and they're just sitting with me when I'm preparing. So I think that is what is a lot of cough. That was the reason. So since this filter has been running, I have not been coughing a lot. The second thing that I did was I changed my uh, intake of uh, s s black seed, Satya Najala. So instead of just taking the black seeds that I used to take, I started taking the black seed oil as well. And so I take two teaspoons of that oil, one in the morning and one in the evening, and it really helps 
keep my pulmonary system uh, tuned. So this is the <laughs> this is the situation. So I thought I'll, I'll share. And now let's talk about the discussions. Twitter had beautiful questions. So I think after a few days, a uh, few weeks of gap, there were important questions that were uh, on Twitter. So there are lots of good questions. So I'm going to start. And we would keep switching back and forth. And we'll go from there. How is everyone over here? <clears throat> so let's start from here, from the live first. So Jenna Taylor says, Dr. Bean, I have a question. Please, my client friend got the vaccine on Tuesday and Wednesday she came down with cold symptoms. Her doctor told her if one has the COVID antibodies, it doesn't protect them. True, that is true. If one has the COVID antibodies, it doesn't protect them. Um, protect them from what? So if I get the vaccine today on Tuesday, so I, I don't know if we're talking about the cold protection or the COVID protection. Uh, Jenna, if I take vaccine today, I am generally not protected from anything uh, till 21 days and over. And ideally the second, after the second dose, seven days after the second dose or 14 days after the second dose is when the actual protection would start. So that is for the COVID. So before that time, one is still exposed. UK has decided to delay the vaccine dosage or doses, and they claim that the data shows 70% protection after the 21 days of the first dose. Now, if we're talking about common cold, so then yes, <coughs> the uh, presence of uh, COVID vaccine and its generated antibodies, which would generate after 10, 15 days, they will not be generated the next day. Even then, these would not protect against common cold or flu or other things. So this is this. Um, HEPA filter on a cat harness should do it. That, that is a good idea. So this HEPA filter that is over here, or the purifier, that has really helped. Um, I, I don't know if I can just pick up my camera and kind of show you. So if you see here, this uh, little device here, that is the filter, and it runs. I turn it off at this time, but it runs during the day. <clears throat> So Nancy Camp says, I have a friend with advanced COVID affecting lungs for two weeks, 76 years with encephalopathy. Is this brain involvement fatal? Nancy, um, so far, neurological damage has not shown to be fatal with COVID. Uh, in this age, there may be something else as well, but with COVID, it is not seen to be fatal, number one. Number two, usually it starts resolving as well. Sometimes these are slower symptoms to resolve, the neurological symptoms, but they start resolving. I hope you have watched my video on brain fog myalgias. And uh, there are some techniques for the cervical spine pumping and the uh, thoracic spine and lumbar spine pumping and the neck massages. So if you can uh, have her watch that or him watch that, that would help and I wish them the best. Uh, Shayur Ram Ramdet says, what are the benefits of zinc in COVID? Is there studies you recommend? So Shayur, I have done a lots of discussion about zinc and quercetin. The idea behind the zinc is that once the zinc enters a cell, the, the zinc uh, blocks or disrupts the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, RDRP. It is an enzyme for COVID-19 that allows the COVID-19 to replicate. So when zinc disrupts that enzyme, the replication of the virus is slowed down. However, the zinc cannot enter the cell easily. So for it to enter the cell, we either need uh, quercetin or we need uh, hydroxychloroquine or we need liposomal zinc. And of course, hydroxychloroquine, talk with your doctor first 
because they would have to check their blood pressure and heart rate and EKG type things to make sure that they you can take hydroxychloroquine. But these are the some of the ionophores are needed to bring zinc in the cell to do this function. And uh, if you look for my videos, I always back up my talk with the references. Even like today, if you go into the description of today's video, you would see that I have links for every discussion I would do. Still, if I make an error, that is on me. But I have the references. So similarly, for zinc studies, zinc videos, you can see a lot of references in the description that you can use for studies. Uh, <clears throat> Mujahid al-Islam says, how does immune system lose ability to defend coronavirus? It doesn't lose ability to defend coronavirus. It actually can defend against the coronavirus. And the deaths occur because our immune system overwhelmingly responds. And in that process, it forgets that it has to calm down. And that is what we call cytokine storm. So that extra response causes the tissue damage, which can even cause our death. <laughs> France, I really love this. Give Luffy a punk haircut. Yeah, we got to do this. Luffy is <laughs> Luffy is a riot. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, Mustafa, thank you very much. Uh, so there was a question, JTJ. So JTJ says, my niece had COVID-19 in November. Then she developed long COVID. Recently, she took ivermectin, eye mask, dosing. And within a week, she recovered from the long COVID. No more fatigue, memory loss, brain fog. This is excellent. And we know that ivermectin is something that is important. And this is why um, I tweeted about this today as well to the UK's uh, London's mayor. Because the situation is really bad in LA. Situation is really bad in London. So I had tweeted to him to say, give them ivermectin, save your people. And the saving is of two types. One, you save their life. Second, you save them from becoming long haulers by treating them so aggressively and early on that they do not develop enough cytokine storms and enough immune system dysregulations that they become long haulers. Long haulers, are, unfortunately, we still have not figured out how to manage them very well. The only reason the long haulers in my patient, my patients are not present is because I very early on, I'm very aggressive. And I start steroids very, um, about seven, 10 days into the disease, I start steroids. And I, I tried my best that they do not enter into the long hauling stage. But when we tell people to stay at home, wait for the uh, hypoxia to start occurring or the oxygen levels to start dropping and difficulty in breathing, that means cytokine storm is starting to occur. That means immune system responses have become dysregulated or intense. And that can, if you save the person, there is still a chance that 30 or 40% are going to become long haulers. That is a bad thing because what I'm seeing is that those patients who have not been taken care of early on and they end up being a long hauler, it is very difficult to get them out of it. They do come out of it, I think, in months and years, but it is difficult. And the misery during this time, imagine headaches and imagine tiredness and fatigue and myalgias and memory lapses. Imagine mood imbalances. Imagine you don't want to do anything. And on top of this, you're stuck in a home. There is there is this pandemic going on. This is a very difficult thing to, to work with, to live with. And so I do not know why our leadership, medical and other, is not able to come to grasps with this thing when plain and simple solutions are present. Maybe that is the, pro the problem, that there are plain and simple solutions, and they don't want to take them. Somebody had asked me on Twitter today that when you are talking about ivermectin, why do they not listen to you? And I say, I responded that it's not just that they do not listen to me. They actually make fun of me. My own friends make fun of me sometimes. They think that I'm that tin hat guy with the, with the um, fringe conspiracy theory that ivermectin can save it and we know what to do and we know the solution and they know I am a crazy guy who doesn't know it. So it, it's terrible. <clears throat> uh, uh, 
So uh, Rima says, why aren't we getting more preventative direction? I'm taking ivermectin, but it's confusing to know the dosage. So Rima, the reason for that is very simple. We have never used ivermectin in this way. So we know the normal therapeutic dose for ivermectin, which is taken once three months or six months or a year for the anti-helminth or anti-parasitic dose. And that is 150 to 200 microgram per kilogram body weight, which for a 70 kilogram person, it comes to be about 11, 12 milligram per day. And I usually give in two divided doses of six milligram in the morning and six milligram in the evening for my patients. Please don't take any of the discussion today as a prescription for any single person here or for anyone who's listening. This is just me talking about my patients. However, what we do not know is exactly what should be the frequency if it is not once a three month or once a six months. So various doctors have been adapting various ways to do it. And uh, what I have been doing is uh, at the minimum, uh, one dose and then third dose, th third day, one more dose, and that is 12 milligram on day one, and then three days later, 12 milligram, and then one month off, and then re repeat every month, that is prophylaxis. Although what I have been doing with my uh, family, friends, patients, whoever listens to me and can get avamectin is once a week, one dose a week. So uh, this is why, Rima, we are not very much clear for what is the right dose. And one more exp espresso. Thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, doctor, have you created previous videos about the immunomodulating effects of vitamin D and its benefits for preventing serious COVID? Absolutely. So yesterday I had tweeted the ivermectin playlist. Maybe I should create a playlist for vitamin D and just tweet that as well. So I would do it. Uh, but if you go to all COVID videos, on my channel in the playlist, there are about 253 videos now, including this one. In there, you would see many vitamin D related videos where I have discussed these things. It is interesting if you go to my early videos, the early days, March, April time, my, my talks about hydroxychloroquine or vitamin D, I was quite nervous in those days because as soon as I would do a video, for example, when I did hydroxychloroquine video, uh, somebody, uh, sent me a threat to say that we are going to get you arrested and we'll throw you in jail and so on. And somebody said, we'll, we'll just get rid of you. And so, so I became nervous. And what I did was I put a lots of disclaimers in the beginning that this is not for you. And this is, this can cause death and so on. So people made fun of those that, Hey, let's count the number of times Dr. Bean says death. But in the early time, you would see lots of videos, which I've done for vitamin D. So, uh, <clears throat> There is one more super chat. Um, A. Aroy Katira, thank you very much for the super chat. Um, Billy Block says, do you use ivermectin, zinc, and so on for SARS-CoV-2? Do you get good results? So my treatment regime used to be that I used to use hydroxychloroquine with zinc and the supplements that I've, I've been talking about from ever. And then um, when the ivermectin studies, I started presenting and started talking. And then we saw the ivermectin study coming out of uh, Australia for in vitro. Then we, from Bangladesh, Dr. Alam started using it. I started using that as well. And I found out that it was much more effective. People would, at any stage of the disease, would start bouncing back so fast and with so little side effects that I then ditched hydroxychloroquine and I started using ivermectin. More super chats, one more espresso. What do you think? Why do you think there isn't more discussion about the benefits of high dose vitamin D supplementation in mainstream media medicine? So I think there are lots of reasons for that. I think if you talk about average common doctors like me, Many doctors are actually whatever they studied in their medical colleges where these things are not taught. Vitamins are not taught in these out of the box ways. They are taught as vitamin D is necessary for calcium metabolism. Here is a daily RDA. Then when they start working, there are very few doctors who would keep up the knowledge. They would just become so busy with the practice. And majority of the practices you go to a specific speciality and you learn from your seniors how they practice and then you just start repeating. 
So it is just a repetition of what are these set standards. There are very few doctors like Dr. Marek, for example, who would think out of the box and then say, you know what, I think from a me mechanism point of view, this is something that should be used and they would try something new. And then if that becomes successful, then that would be adapted as well. And then there is, of course, the pharmaceuticals and research work in the universities whose job is to figure out other things to be used and then bring them back to the mainstream medical practice. The problem is that pharmaceuticals are not really being uh, very true to people. They are more true to their own products. And universities only get AIDS for those kind of researches where the, this research would eventually benefit someone. So I think the whole system had become skewed. The, the good news was that system was working fine when there was no pandemic. So the run of the mill day to day practice was actually fine and the researches were moving us inch by inch forward. And then came this pandemic and we all got caught unprepared. In this situation then, very few of the doctors actually rose up and said, you know what, I'm going to go and study and I'm going to go and explore more. And then I'm going to see how do I save the patients or humans. And most of the doctors stuck to here is your recommended thing to do. Please go ahead and do it. In societies like Europe and US, because litigation is common, especially in the US, over here, doctors or, or professionals are even more scared of trying something new because they can become then liable for the outcome if it is not right. On the other hand, those countries where were, there were less strong rules, there it became easier to try ivermectins and hydroxychloroquines and steroids and, and start mixing and matching and experimenting. This is why if you say, see countries like Pakistan or India or other, uh, Bangladesh, what they have done is they are able to get these some of these drugs over the counter and people are getting treated at home and they are doing much better. So this is the kind of uh, outcome. What should have happened was the organizations like WHO, CDCs, FDAs should have formed wings right away to say, hey, 20 people, your job is to find the new research that is coming in, find the new voices that are saying this is useful, that is that is useful, filter them out, research that data, figure out what is the right thing and bring it to us. And we on an expeditious way will make them part of prophylaxis or part of early treatment and so on. That was sorely missing. Instead, what I saw was, and I've been criticized about it by saying this, what I saw was people were just so happy going on the TV and just telling every time it's going to become really bad. It's going to become really sad. It's going to become really gloomy. It's going to become really dark. People should be staying away. People should be doing this. They should be staying at home. So it was just a lot of noise without any practical outcome. And I have always been giving this example of this. My mother used to tell me this example that uh, she used to jokingly tell me that uh, there was a monkey who became the king of the jungle and a goat lost her kids. And she came to the monkey, to the king and said, I've lost my, my kids. And monkey started going up the tree and down and then the next tree and down and then the next tree. And he, keep, he kept doing this for the whole day. In the evening, the goat said, dear king, where are my kids? And monkey said, forget about the kids. Look at my effort. I'm going the whole day. I went up and down the trees for you to find your children. So I think that many of the leaders just started doing the monkey business of going up the tree and down without actually bringing in something useful for us. After a year, we're still stuck. So sorry, <laughs> there was a super chat that got me on this rant. Uh, thank you very much for this super chat. Thank you very much for this next super chat as well. Ivermectin 12 milligram on day one, three, and five, then 12 milligram once a week, once a month. So for how long? and as far as prophylaxis do. So the, the studies that I have discussed here, ivermectin once a month, two days in one month, on day one and day three. Some studies said day one and day five. 
and then that is 12 milligram on day one. Again, 150 microgram to 200 microgram per kilogram body weight. And whatever that dose comes to be once in a day and then another day, once third day. Then wait for a month to complete, then repeat. I have done differently with my patients. So that is mine. I do one 12 milligram, for example, for a 70 kilogram person once a week. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> Abdul Razak says, you are right, but how these multimillionaires are going to earn more? You're correct. But the thing is this, there, there comes a time where we have to put those things aside. We would always earn again. If somebody is a multimillionaire, they know how to earn, they would earn again. At some point, we should become a little more empathetic to people to say at this time, there is an opportunity to serve. There is a need to serve. Why not I serve? So I think multimillionaire, that mindset causes them to have forgotten the humanity part of it. But that is what was needed. Uh, Sandy says, hi, Dr. Bean. First time I caught you live. I am concerned about adjuvants in traditional vaccines aggravating autoimmunity. Do you think mRNA vaccines might be a good option for people with autoimmunity? Absolutely, yes. And this exact point has been discussed both for Pfizer and Moderna in their FDA papers that there are no adjuvants present in there. Or more specifically, they say we do not need those traditional adjuvants because a lipid nanoparticle itself can act as an adjuvant. So because of that, these are relatively safer. Thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, <clears throat> so there is a question. So I haven't even gotten a chance to go to Twitter. Uh, question, Shayur Ramdat says, have you seen New France variant? Please, can you cover this soon, Doc? Can't find good info. I will do it. I have not seen the France variant. I've talked about the variant from South Africa and then the variant from UK. Haven't looked at the France one. I would look at it. Um, Carl says, I'm 70 years old and very healthy, 70 year young. Because I'm reaching these ages as well, I call these ages young now and very healthy, except I have hypo gamma globulinemia. Okay. Without IVIG therapy, IgG is 200, IgA is 6, and IgM is current. Currently on IVIG therapy, immunodeficient folks were not included in the vaccine clinical trials. Are there safety uh, concerns in taking mRNA vaccine? Many immuno and hematologists are saying, wait. So the going back to the uh, discussion from these papers, they have actually said that immunodeficient folks are actually in the key category to get these vaccines early on. So UK has prioritized them as well, and US has prioritized them as well. So immunodeficient folks should get the vaccine. Thank you for the super sticker. <clears throat> Denise says, my friend who has lupus had Pfizer yesterday. So far, so good. Excellent. Very good to know. Absolutely. <laughs> um, are kids really, Mr. J says, are kids really not catching this, not even hearing about MISC anymore. No, they are catching it. They uh, they mostly are able to combat it fine. They are able to handle it better. But this is still happening. If you actually start filtering the news on kids, you would see that they this is still happening. You're welcome. Yeah, so JTJ, this is a new thing that there are some areas where vaccines are present and they are not able to administer them. I would suspect that to the hospital staff. And so they have started offering them to other folks as well. Thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, there was another red super chat here as well. Thank you very much. All right. <clears throat> <laughs> yes, yes, I am hogged at this time. I haven't even gotten a chance to actually go back there. Uh, do the vaccines use? And and to the folks who have given me questions on Twitter, if I couldn't get to them because we have the questions here, then we will continue our forum tomorrow 
and I would get to them. So please don't mind. So let's see. Uh, Shana says, question one doc saying vitamin D loading dose of 1000 IU per pound per day for three days. Thoughts? So I am pretty <laughs> bold with vitamin D. So again, don't take this as a prescription for anyone because vitamin D can dysregulate your calcium metabolism depending upon your kidney situation, depending upon your bones situation, depending upon your magnesium level, your calcium levels, your parathyroid levels, and your um, K2 levels. So this is not anything for anyone specific here. I usually start, I give uh, where I can. In some countries, I cannot. But in some countries, I can actually give 200,000 international units loading dose. And then I start for with 1,000 or 5,000 or 10,000, depending upon the situation and the age and the need. So uh, no worries with the higher dose in the beginning. My own vitamin D levels were 19 nanogram per milliliter, which was a shock for me because I had been taking 10,000 international units on a daily basis for uh, lots of days. So then I had to load myself and then correct it and then come down and ramp down the dosage. Yes, so uh, Machiavelli, you're correct. Depleted K2 is implicated in severe COVID, correct. And I have talked about it, that K2 levels should be kept correct as well. Um, Yes, so Janet, the deceased doctor from Florida, received the vaccine going in, had zero platelets. So the, they say that going in, he was healthy. So I would show you that. I have that link over here, uh, and I was going to discuss that. So why not we take this opportunity to discuss it right now? So the, the doctor here, perfectly healthy Florida doctor dies weeks after getting Pfizer COVID vaccine. So the doctor's age was uh, unfortunate, really. 56 year old, young man. So he had the Pfizer vaccine. And then a few days later, he went back in the emergency because he started having um, petechial hemorrhages, small red dots under the skin, which are indicators of bleeding under the skin, which would mean such bleeding may be happening in the other visceras as well. It says that we can see it when it is happening under, under the skin. And so um, that is the idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura or ITP. What does that mean is that the platelets, and I have done discussions in detail about platelets in the COVID context, they are present in the same playlist. The platelet's job is to cause coagulation whenever there is an injury. And so COVID-19, so here we're not talking about COVID-19, but generally COVID-19 can cause inside of a blood vessel to become scratched and to become damaged. And that bleeding that occurs there or the damage that occurs there can cause platelet aggregations or thrombi formation, which in itself is bad, although it helps to prevent the bleeding. In this case, uh, what is happening is that vaccines or other um, drugs are sometimes they can invoke the thrombocytopenic purpura. So I have this study over here. Every link is present in the description below. Um, so if you are, most of the time, some, some folks come up to me and, for example, yesterday somebody wrote that he's just an influencer on the on YouTube. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So fine, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I always talk with references. So here is a reference. So if you see here, this is a case report of somebody who was given a vaccine. And then three weeks later, he developed severely reduced platelet levels. And the reason here, the conjecture, the possibility, one is that it is possible that bone marrow toxicity occurred. So it is possible, again, uh, Pfizer is saying that we are researching it. Pfizer says we don't think it is related to the vaccine. It may be something else. Uh, a healthy person all of a sudden develops it after the vaccine, but two weeks after the vaccine or a few days after the vaccine, there is nothing else that is given. So it vaccine would have to be looked at as well. So here, bone marrow toxicity and the second is increased destruction of normal platelet 
both immune med mediated or not. So where it may be that the vaccine caused, and I'm just uh, hypothesizing here, it may be totally wrong that the vaccine triggered the immune system in such way that they started creating antibodies that would then attach to platelets and then platelet destruction occurs. So what does that mean? It happens sometimes that here is a platelet and we some infection occurred or some drug was given that created antibodies and somehow those antibodies cross reacted with the platelet surface which would then open up the platelet for complement activation and destruction by our immune system. So was it possible that the doctor developed that kind of thrombocytopenic purpura? So if you see here, the incidence of drug-induced AITP in the general population is approximately 10 cases per million inhabitants per year, and its pathogenesis is not completely understood yet. However, immunoglobulin G type antibodies against platelet glycoprotein and these are the glycoprotein numbers, seems to play an important role. So same thing here, as I just said, it is possible that IgG produced can attack the platelet specific antibodies, uh, um, uh, proteins here, and kind of get stuck with them. And if an antibody gets stuck to something in our body, in our tissue or pathogen or bacteria or virus or fungus, that thing is in trouble because the complement will become activated and the wherever the antibody is attached, that tissue cell is going to be destroyed. So um, don't know exactly what had happened, but this is a possibility. OK, so Peter King says that, please comment on Dr. Merrick's appeal to the British Prime Minister. I haven't yet seen that. I talked with him almost every week. I've been connecting with him. He's in Texas right now. So he said, I'll be back next week. And we will, I, I think he'll be here on our show. So that would give us a chance to ask him more questions as well. I also tweeted to them. But I think the way these folks are working, as I said before, they just simply dismiss these and say, you know what? They are not say, telling the truth. They are just those fringe doctors, uh, fringe groups of doctors who believe in these kind of things. And then it is easy to just dismiss them. That is the unfortunate part. So SNC says calcium lactate works wonders for cough as well as fever. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Jem says, hello, beans. Uh, hey, Jem, how are you? Welcome. Um, <clears throat> Jem, I know that you have a Twitter question as well. If we reach Twitter today, we'll answer that today, otherwise tomorrow. Uh, Shayur Ramit says, off topic from COVID, so apologies. What topic in medicine are in the works post COVID to be covered on your channel? So uh, when I started medicine teaching, my belief was that doctors and nurses need to understand medicine in a more simple way, in a more approachable way, so that they can use those concepts that have become recallable and they can use to apply them when their patient is in front of them. Uh, I always say that when a doctor is treating a patient, there are no books present with him, although nowadays you can look up. So they have to have clear concepts. So for this reason, we have been actually working on physiology and pathology and clinical medicine. So these are the topics that we are working on. We are not very, very uh, funded. So most of this is just me trying to do this or some doctors who can help me. But uh, clinical medicine, physiology, pathology, pharmacology are the topics that I, I'm working with. Maybe I should start a Patreon and then request folks to support us. But that is the basic idea. This kind of a talk that we are doing, I think that this is what is needed for doctors and nurses as well. And it is a chance for us to reach them when they are in medical schools or nursing schools, because there they are open to studying. And if you can reach them, approach them and provide them better education at that time, then hopefully in the future, they will be more open. Plus, they would be more knowledgeable. Um, Absolutely correct, Makai, that they, there are so much conflict of interest. But 
there are times when you can leave your conflict of interest on a side. For example, I tell you, I have an interest in running my business and growing it. I have many competitors who are growing very well. And what I did was, it is a criticism from some people to me that what Mubin did was he left everything from the business point of view and he started just doing COVID for the whole year. So uh, sometimes my students reach out to me and say, we see nothing more new other than 800 lectures I, I, that we had done before COVID and everything new is just COVID. So you're not feeding us more data, more content. And that is correct. But sometimes you have to take such uh, risks, if you will, to be able to contribute. And if somebody says that I would only contribute if I do not have a risk, then they are really not servicing. So you're correct that there is conflict of interest, but that should be put on a side for some time. Arun says, patient with extreme thrombosis and D-dimers value 2650, which is best anticoagulant apart from uh, DB, Gitron, aspirin, Copic Dugrol. So RTPA and enoxaparin, I have Arun talked about them. So if you go back to the hypercoagulable state, in there, I have talked them both. And yes, RTPA and enoxaparin are the ones. Hopefully, if uh, if he's in that state, he must be in a uh, hospital and they know what is the right thing to do based on the lab results. Um, okay, so there's another topic here. Cheryl says, why are side effects worse after the second dose of vaccine? Won't you have some antibodies ready to go from first dose? Absolutely. So that is why the side effects are more. So what happens is, uh, let's say this is a this is our naive immune system that has not seen the COVID-19 yet. And we let's say instead of infection, we have given the vaccine to the person. And what vaccine has done is introduce the spike protein in the system. So when the spike proteins are introduced, these are foreign things and these are antigens. So that causes our immune system to react to it. And that reaction in the local places would cause the, the symptoms that we see, local reaction of pain and, and um, you know redness and so on, sore arm. And then when that cytokine becomes a little bit more available in the body, then the fever and myalgias and other things happen. Now imagine that our immune system has become trained with the first dose. So our cells are actually ready. Previously, they were not ready. Previously, when the first dose was given, only the innate arm was ready. And it took 7, 10, 15 days for the acquired arm to become ready. So they all of the immune, immune system did not respond. It was just the innate arm that was responding. Now, when you give the second dose, you have a larger set of soldiers sitting in there and they are going to immediately respond within 24 hours by immediately. That's what I mean. So within 24 hours, they're going to respond. And of course, they're going to create more cytokines and they're going to create what happens is when you give the second dose, the cells proliferate. A cells proliferation means increasing in number. So if there were 100,000 cells, they would become million cells or 10 million cells. Number one and number two, they become mature. So mature means they start recognizing the antigen or the, or the enemy with better clarity. So this proliferated number of cells, this huge number of cells, these are going to release a lot of cytokines as well. So that is what's going to happen the next time. And that would, of course, cause a, uh, a more intense set of symptoms. The good news is that because vaccine cannot persist like a virus, it cannot go from one cell and replicate and come out and go to the next cell and then come out and then go to the next cell and just keep repeating that process and keep making us, you know, our immune system go nuts. Vaccine cannot do it. Whatever amount of vaccine is given, it is going to uh, trigger a set amount of immune system and then that vaccine is destroyed and that immune system calms down and goes to sleep again. So it it is possibly two, three days of the symptoms and then we are back to normal. Thank you so much. There are so many super chats that I cannot even keep track of them. So everyone who has just done super chat, thank you very much. Um,
So the man, this is a really important uh, comment here. After 10 months, not one person I know, not even allergies, flu and cold are totally gone, gone now. So here's the deal. I had been saying this, contrary to what the medical leadership was coming on the TVs and saying, we're going to get hammered by the cold season and we're going to be in lots of trouble. I had been saying that because we have been taking care more, because we have been physically distancing, because we have been wearing masks, because we have been washing our hands, because we are keeping ourselves healthy, we are taking vitamins, we are taking other supplements, I think we would have a lower level of the uh, respiratory diseases. And that is what is being seen. There is drastically low numbers of people with flu and with other common colds. So, Mike, have people died from the vaccines? I think that there are a few news that say people have died. I had thought I would do research and come back with it. So I still have to do that research. Looking at the news, there are news that people have died. So Arun says, I'm feeling low today. Lots of coffee, none from my side. I want to do, but we use debit card. I also want to show my gratitude. Uh, Arun, your presence here, your time here is sufficient. I have never come in here with this intent or with this ask for donations or support. I say it at the end of the lecture, but this is not at all to make anyone feel uncomfortable. You are welcome the way you are. Your time is appreciated. Your attention is appreciated. And as a result of the discussions, when you take care of yourselves and the people around you, that is the real outcome that I need. So thank you very much. Please don't feel bad at all. So, uh, so Fabio says, Doctor, please, your opinion about Russian and Chinese vaccines. Some countries in Latino America, they are buying these. If you only have these two vaccines, would you take them? So I'm going to be blunt, and this message is going to be out of my ignorance. No, I will not take Sputnik, or I would not take Chinese vaccines yet. And the reason is, despite my effort to try to find data, I'm not able to find their data. So with I have become so used to Western way of transparency, although we are finding that to be even low at this time, but still there is so much transparency that we say, here is the data, there is how many number of people died and here are the number of people who are sick and so on. These vaccines have not given us that data yet. So without that data, I am very hesitant to take these. <laughs> so, yes, I've heard of Ninja Nerd. He does good work as well. Um, I, I tried to reach out in the beginning of the discussions to uh, Metcram and to Campbell, and they did not even have the grace to even just respond. So since then, I have stopped inviting someone who may be looking at us as a competitor. I am not acting as a competitor to anyone at this time because we are just having to do a service at this time. We can be, we can compete afterwards. So mostly now I'm, I'm reaching out to folks like Dr. Marek or Dr. Drew or Dr. Yo and Dr. Bruce Patterson. So those who don't take me as their competitors and are ready to come in and talk. Okay, so um, if you're okay, I'm gonna now go to Twitter as well and look at some of the things here. So first of all, Mariesta Dershe says, why take vaccine if quercetin and zinc work or ivermectin as prophylactic or for use if infected by virus? The uh, important thing, Mariesta, is this. The quercetin, zinc, we know that they temper, they blunt the reaction. However, because we haven't yet seen them exactly in case of cytokine storms, 
to be working. For example, we know that there are folks who have been taking hydroxychloroquine profile and still ended up in cytokine storm. So there is something still out there that if a person is vulnerable to virus a little more than others, then they still get in trouble. The numbers reduce drastically. The impact, positive impact of these things is present. For example, in cool beans, my experience is any cool bean who had been doing this and when they were even in advanced age, I saw them coming out of the problem with much more ease and not reach towards the severe cases. Vaccine is a sure shot way. Again, uh, notwithstanding the criticism that they are rapidly created or they're not tested well, or there are uh, other issues with the vaccine or the anti-vaxxer kind of a phenomena, leaving that aside, vaccines are much more sure way of triggering our immune system. So the risk that there may still be someone, and maybe let's say if I'm taking hydroxy and zinc, I may still be someone out of 100, that one person who might die because these things would not protect against the overwhelming response of the cytokine storm. Because these drugs have not been 100% safe, but they are very, very safe. So because of this, I think vaccine, my opinion, vaccine is important as well. Twiddlebit says, what is your opinion on this doctor's reaction? So this is the, the reaction that we just talked about a little bit. Uh, one, it is a sad thing. Uh, of course, he has been serving and then um, he went for his own vaccination and um, had this issue. If you see here, this is Pfizer saying we don't believe at this time that there is any direct connection to the vaccine. Then Pfizer also told USA Today there is no indication either from large clinical trials or among people who have received the vaccine since the government authorized its use last month that it could be connected to thrombocytopenia. So this is what they are saying. Although we know that some vaccine can actually cause thrombocytopenia, and I've shown you this study here. So that is the answer to Twiddlebit. Then is David Demera. Do I need to sleep with a mask on? David, ideally not. It depends where you are. For example, let's say and there are so many super chats. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and I'll get to it in a second. Uh, <clears throat> David, if you are traveling and you are going to end up uh, sleeping somewhere where there may be folks who are um, who may be con uh, contagious, then mask may be necessary. For example, a doctor who is working in a hospital and in a COVID clinic, even if they are going to take a nap, they would still need to protect themselves. But if you're talking about regular at night at home where you've been with your family members for a long time and you know that they are safe, they don't have the virus, you don't need to have a mask, neither during the day or, or at night. So let me come here for a second. This is Maria Sadesh. Thank you very much for your $99.99 super chat. Thank you. Um, imagination sense, uh, uh, super chat. How do we answer conspiracy theories that they say the mortality rate is low, so the virus is not serious? Someone I know keeps saying that. This do I ignore? <laughs> so two answers. Of course, once you ignore, because what I've learned is that despite my, um, my effort to present the scientific parts and then the studies, folks who are not going to um, be convinced they would not be convinced because they have some other thing in their mind that they want to justify. They would hold on to their belief. So the, the best cases for these kind of examples are that if you look at some of my vaccine related talks where I am correcting some of the scientific miscalculations or misrepresentations, you would see right under there, whatever I have actually debunked right under there, they would say, so you are saying this and they are actually saying that I am saying what I am debunking. So they would just reverse it. So what I've learned is that it is not necessary to argue, at least at this time, because the reason is, if I don't argue, and if I don't push back, if I don't bad mouth, then the folks would continue to come and watch. And maybe if they don't like a vaccine, they'll find something else useful here. Maybe they'll find ivermectin useful, or they would find hydroxychloroquine, or zinc, or melatonin, or something that would be useful for them. So I don't argue with anyone 
so that they are not um, they don't go away. I usually remove those links that have uh, those comments that have links to something else, some conspiracy theory, or those comments that uh, are simply rude and they are disrespectful. Although if you look at it, in case of vaccines, I did not remove them because there is an emotional state attached there and I didn't want to suppress that emotional state. And people yelled at me, if you go and you see it. So I just continue. But answering your question, how do we answer the conspiracy theories that they say mort mortality rate? I have discussed this many times. Let's say this is a geography. Let's say this is US. And let's say we have 300 million people. Out of 300 million, at this time, let's say we have 20 million that are infected. And out of 20 million, there are unfortunately 300,000 that have died. Now what happens is those folks who want to minimize this, they say out of 300, 300 million, there are only 300,000 deaths that is a very small rate. That is correct. But what is important, the, the disingenuity in this, I think whoever coined this way of thinking, he was first disingenuous. Many people actually do not know epidemiology in this way. What happens is this is a pandemic that is still growing. So today we are at 20 million. And out of 20 million, we are more than that, but let's use this as a number. Out of 20 million, 300,000 are dead. And we do not know when will it actually stop. So using 300,000 as a number to justify this number is incorrect because the pandemic has not stopped yet. When the pandemic has finished, then we can take an account to say out of 300,000, 300 million, we had X number of deaths, X number of cases, and the ratio is the following. That infection rate and the infection fatality rate will be the right one. At this time, every day, this number grows. So saying, well, today it is 0 0.01 is not fair because tomorrow it's going to be more and more and more and more because it is going on. So the right way at this time is to look at the number of cases and then to look at the number of deaths. Although there are then folks who would come back and say, well, the number of cases are more because we tested more. So what? Fine. It actually goes in their favor. If you test more and you discover more then the fraction who have died, that that number would continue to shrink. For example, if one person dies out of 100, that is 1%. But if one person dies out of 200, that is half percent. So the more testing is actually going to give them more strength. But saying this, that more testing is what caused more cases, and that is not correct. So this is the reason this thinking is wrong. Once we stabilize, once the pandemic is gone, then we would see what are the real numbers. So Peter King says Campbell is uh, pro-mask. I am pro-mask. Um, Dr. Marek is pro-mask and so on. Um, once again, uh, thank you very much. Madig, thank you for the super chat as well. Happy New Year to you and your family. Let's hope the COVID-19 pandemic calm down in the later parts of the year. Absolutely. Happy New Year back to you as well. And thank you very much. There is a line of super chat. So uh, thank you, everyone. Let's continue our discussion. Wayne, so Wayne says, so there, are, uh, Laura, you're correct. There are many, many reasons, but this simple bigger issue of saying out of 300,000, 300 million, there is just 300,000 and trying to minimize it that way is actually insulting. Uh, Wayne said that he has not laughed like out like this in years. Tell me how. 
<laughs> All right, so the, there's something going on with the chat. All right, back here with the Twitter for a second. Do I need to sleep with the mask? So responded, cool me number 381. Should you keep wearing a mask beyond the 28 days after receiving the vaccine? Do you need to wear a mask after recovering from COVID? So let me answer that question. There are two or three answers to this. Number one, once a person is infected and recovered, they actually do not need the mask after that because they have become protected. The reinfection rate is really low. However, so that is the first answer. Technically, scientifically, that is the answer. The second part of this is the social part of it. It is possible that if you're not wearing a mask, for example, yesterday I went to some store here and I forgot to wear a mask and I just stepped in and the person yelled and said, you need to wear a mask and I came out. So imagine if I had uh, been infected and recovered. Now if it's, I stood there and argued with him and said, look, I have in, in, been infected and recovered and let me come in without a mask, uh, that would not work very well. So there is a social aspect as well. If another part of this answer is, it is possible that I have recovered, but let's say I picked up the virus from somebody and there is some virus present in my mouth. I don't know yet that that is enough to throw back out and cause somebody else sick. Ideally, the immunoglobulins A that are present in the mucous membranes should catch the virus and they should be coating it. And if it is ejected again, it should not go and do anything because now immunoglobulins are attached to it. So that is the second part of the second answer. Now, the third answer that you said about the vaccine, the way vaccines work, for example, Moderna two dose vaccines, and they all have different dosing schedule. So I'm going to take Moderna, for example. Moderna says day one, the first dose, then 21 days later, three weeks later, the second dose, and then 14 days after, I believe, is the protection start. Although it is not as hard and fast as that, but they have taken the maximum boundaries of immune system activation. So during this time, during this time, infection has been observed and rightfully so because our immune system may not yet be fully active. Now, for some people, it might have become activated here. For some people, it might have become sufficiently activated here. For some, it might be here and for some, it might be here. So because we do not know exact days for everyone's response time, then the be better thing is to take two doses and then continue on for the second 14 days after the second dose or seven days after the second dose, like for Pfizer. Still, the social part is still there. And that is fine. You have the vaccine and you have the seven days after the second dose. Now, if you're roaming around without the mask, ideally you are protected, but the social part would still be bothersome. So good question, Cool Bean, uh, 381. Luke Henry, which vaccine do you think will come next? What do you think about the Novo Novavax vaccine? I really loved it. So then the Centurio de Sang Rizul says best in class. So let's look at this. I actually liked the uh, vaccine here. This is also another article about thrombocytopenic purpura associated with polyethylene glycate. And polyethylene glycate is present in the Pfizer and Moderna. So this is the thrombocytopenic purpura associated with them. And so maybe that happened with the doctor in Florida, unfortunately. So this is the Novovax. I love this idea of this vaccine. It is very different from Moderna, Pfizer. It is very different from traditional uh, vaccines, uh, attenuated virus. It is very different from adenovirus as well. So what they do is the following. And I thought I have this link in the description. It would be great if you can actually watch their video as well for how it works. But what they do is this. So let's start from here. What they do is they take the viral RNA for the spike protein, right? So Moderna does that, Pfizer does that, adenovirus based, AstraZeneca does it. So take the spike protein RNA, genetic material. Then bring it into a bacteria. So this is going to be manufactured in the bacteria. 
So you bring that in the bacteria. And over there, there are replication of that genetic material. So bacteria is going to make copies of it. Imagine the bacteria are used as photocopying machines to copy the genetic material. Once we have sufficient genetic material, then bring it into the infected insect cells. So remember the fetal tissue issue where we're saying, well, don't use the fetal tissue cells and so on. Here, they do not use the fetal tissue cells. Instead, they use insect cells. I'm sure that some folks are going to come up and say, I hate insect cells and I do not want them. But it is still better than a fetal tissue copy cells. Fine. So they inject that RNA. This is all happening in the lab, nothing in our body. They inject that RNA in the cells of insects. And what happens is those cells are going to use that RNA to actually make spike proteins. Correct? That is what Moderna and Pfizer vaccines do in our body. So here we are getting these spike proteins manufactured by the insect cells. Then what they do is they break down those cells and pick up the spike proteins from it. So once they have the spike proteins, then what they do is they put them together in small particles and they inject them to us. So here they're not giving messenger RNA. Here they're not giving adenovirus. Here they're not giving an attenuated virus. Instead, they are giving spike protein itself. And then they are hoping that as they introduce them in our body, our immune system is going to look at them and say, what the heck is this? I do not like this thing. And they would start reacting to it, as we have discussed many times. And that is how they're going to take care of it. I love this vaccine. So um, they are starting their trial. So if you see here, trial to enroll up to 30,000 volunteers across approximately 115 sites in the US and Mexico. That trial is starting. It is phase three. But they're starting now. And they are expecting that they would have data, I believe, somewhere in January or February. So they are a little behind, but very interesting technology. I love this technology. So um, <laughs> I love it so much, I'm going to repeat it. So if you don't throw anything at me, they take the RNA of the virus, the spike protein part. They put that in a bacteria. This is called recombination. They put that in the bacteria and ask the bacteria to make copies of uh, that RNA. So the ones they have ample genetic material, then they, they give it to insect cells. And the insect cell, just like Moderna and Pfizer vaccine would do it when we send the messenger RNA in our cells and we would make spike proteins. Here, the insect cell would make spike proteins. Then they would harvest those spike proteins from there. And then they would make a vaccine out of them. And when that is injected in our body, our body's immune system is just going to respond. And here we got the immunization. Beautiful. So I would request everyone to watch this video. It's nice. Then uh, <clears throat> there is another vaccine from Johnson & Johnson. This vaccine is also interesting and possibly single dose. So they are testing with two doses and with one dose. So possibly single dose. And single dose would be much more convenient. For example, I plan to travel at some point once I have the vaccination. And I continue to think that, well, I have to wait for the first dose. Then I have to wait for a month and then the second dose and then another 15 days. Only then can I travel. So if I have to travel before that, I can't just take the first dose and go away. So this is the Johnson & Johnson that is going to be single dose. So <clears throat> this is adenovirus-based vaccine as well. So it has the same issue that it is going to be made in some sort of a cell. But it is one dose, possibly. So Luke, Henry, uh, hopefully that answers your question. I'm still looking into the CanSinos and Sinovax and Sinopharm vaccines. We'll see what happens there. I still have to find data. Uh, Chris who says, I'm taking daily quercetin, zinc, vitamin D, vitamin C, and once a week hydroxychloroquine. Lucky you. Can I still take it before and after the vaccination against COVID, or is it harmful to the effectiveness of the vaccination? So let's think about it. The function of hydroxychloroquine to prevent or reduce the infection and spread of the SARS-CoV-2 is that it causes, so let's say here is a cell, Hydroxychloroquine number one reduces the binding of the SARS-CoV-2 with our cell, correct? So that is one area. 
Secondly, it reduces the fusion of the of the envelope of the SARS-CoV-2 with our cell membrane, which is necessary for the RNA from the SARS-CoV-2 to enter our cells. Once the RNA is present, then hydroxychloroquine causes the, the pH of our cell. It makes it acidic, actually less acidic, which causes the cellular machinery to function less. And when it functions less, then it would function less for the virus as well. Then hydroxychloroquine causes zinc to be invited in. And that zinc is going to go and block the RDRP enzyme of the virus and stop it from replicating. All of those functions are not necessary for a vaccine. Because of that, vaccine will not be affected by hydroxychloroquine. Here is why. Number one, when we give, let's say, a lipid nanoparticle, which has the messenger RNA. Lipid nanoparticle is going to fuse here, and this fusion does not need the virus fusion mechanisms where we need the PPR, uh, TMPRSS2 proteins, and we need the fusion with the specific receptors. All that is not necessary. Lipid nanoparticle is just going to cross in. So hydroxy would not do anything. Then as the nanoparticle is in here, and it releases the messenger RNA, now it is possible that the cell would respond slowly because hydroxychloroquine has made the environment a little more basic in nature, but it would still respond and it would work fine. As long as you haven't taken so much hydroxy that you are just not functioning at all. So as long as you are functioning, the cell would function as well. Then the zinc, even if it comes in, this protein, this messenger RNA that is present, does not need RDRP. We are not asking this RNA to be duplicated. So we don't need any RDRPs. This messenger RNA is directly going to go to the uh, ribosome and make spike proteins. So all of those functions would stay intact without, with or without hydroxychloroquine. So what you're taking is not going to affect vaccines function, fortunately. Okay, so let me come here to the live side. There are so many super chats. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so Kat says China is doing fine now. Imagine that. Yeah, that is interesting. The whole world is stuck. Uh, so AJ says, question, could Novo Vac be in mosquito no go ac they could vaccinate a population fast mosquito always sting <laughs> yeah so they can if they can infect a mosquito so you know that when the mosquito comes and bites us it drinks our blood so we will have to somehow infect mosquito in a way that when it drinks our blood it then injects the the vaccine back into us as well but that's interesting idea I'm just looking for questions here. Do you know that there has been an outcome of these uh, live discussions? And that is that there has a group of cool beans that actually meet everyone every day here in the live chats. So Shahida says, shouldn't people recovered from COVID and safe in mouth and nose be able to transmit it through their hands? Of course. Uh, they can transmit it through their hands. They can transmit. These are called um, contaminations and fomite production. So yes, that can happen. And one can actually touch, for example, some surface which is dirty, and then touch another surface and transmit that. Yes. Billy says, which out of the two mRNA, the Oxford is, and the Ox uh, mRNA, I believe you're saying Moderna versus Oxford. Oh, sorry. So Moderna, Pfizer versus AstraZeneca. So we have talk, talked about it. Um, none of them have been uh, so far known to cause danger 
other than transverse myelitis was seen, or now there are some deaths that are being reported. So ideally, they should all be equally, at least from the data, they're all equally safe. Um, Janet says, Brom Hexin, any thoughts? So Janet, I have done two talks, actually three talks about Brom Hexin. There was one talk where I talked about the mechanism of action. There was one more talk where we talked about some Brom Hexin-like other drugs. And then there was a talk where I had a doctor from Florida, I believe so, from Florida cardiologist who joined me with his protocol that used bromhexine or TMPRSS2 blockers. So they, all these three videos are present in the uh, playlist. Please uh, look at them. My thought has been so far that there has been data that shows they work and that there is data that shows they don't work. So there is still, there is still no 100% um, proof that they would work. There is both kinds of studies are available. But I like bromhexin and I've talked about it. Ivan says, great work now, uh, nearly 12 months of followers. Would love you to start getting ready for the next pandemic, even find cures for the cancer, et cetera. I think we should work on cancer, diabetes, uh, heart issues, and so on. There are important things to discuss. So once this thing cools down a little bit, and as I always say when I talk with my friends, if I'm alive by then, then we would definitely talk about more things. So Iram Afshan has a question. If someone recovered from the COVID-19 with the minor symptoms, don't this person can be a carrier anyway of the virus? If no, so why they are not allowing recovered people to travel without coronavirus test? So <clears throat> somebody who has been infected and recovered are actually fine. And uh, carrier long haulers is a situation where there are folks who may be carriers we do not know if they are contagious through respiratory system. Maybe the fecal route may be. So the thing is this, if we started saying that I had the infection and I had re have recovered and I'm fine, then everybody would start saying it just to be able to travel. I think that is why they asked for the test. The only problem is that if when you get infected and you recover, you should get your antibody test soon after that because antibody titers are going to reduce. And then two months, three months, four months later, if you get the tests, you may not have enough titers to show that you are positive because our cells would go to sleep and not do that much of antibody production. When, the, when we get reinfected, then they would ramp up and they would immediately take care of it. And again, immediately means 24 hours. So then the antibodies would go back up. So as soon as you have uh, become recovered, you should get your antibody tests. But it is more of a, an administrative problem that who are they going to be believing or not. <laughs> there is a discussion going on about condoms as well in the discussion of COVID. Barbara, thank you very much for the super sticker. <laughs> okay, so looks like less questions here. So I'm going to go back to the uh, oh, Twitter for a second. And if your question is being missed, can you please just put the word question or question mark with it? Simple Garden, this is a very good question. Would someone recovered from COVID-19 only require one vaccine instead of two? So I suspect you're saying one dose versus two. So 
I'm going to give you two answers. Number one, somebody who has recovered should ideally not need a vaccine unless their status, immune status has changed. For example, it is more than three years and the pandemic is still there and occurred again. Or the virus has mutated and it's altogether a new variant. Or they became immunosuppressed. Or they are receiving drugs that made them immunosuppressed or they got some kind of a transplantation, which then necessitated the immunosuppression to occur. For example, bone marrow transplant and so on. So if the bone marrow transplant has occurred, then the new transplanted bone marrow may not know how to make those memory B cells and T cells. So in such cases, it may be necessary to get the vaccine again. So now on a more administrative side, they, they are saying, well, you had the infection or not, just take the vaccine. That is fine. If you were infected and recovered, you will handle it again as well. Vaccine is nothing in, in front of the actual, compared to the actual infection again. And you can actually handle the actual infection again. Vaccine is going to do not much. So maybe it would just do some more proliferation of the cells and you'll become even more robust about it. But it doesn't matter. So one dose or two doses, ideally none of those are required. But if you take it, you take one or two, your body is not even going to think about it. So there's a question from Scott. Can a person who has received both vaccines still contract the virus and be infectious to others? So. <clears throat> Let's answer this one uh, in this way, uh, Scott. I have been talking about this. Look, let's say you have gotten the vaccine and then you have gotten the days after that. So dose one, then let's say 21 days later, dose two, then another seven days and the protection starts. So you are in this phase here. So what will happen in this phase is that you have IgGs produced and then you have IgAs produced. Of course, you had IgM produced as well, but we don't care about them at this time. These IgGs are sitting around and moving around in the tissues, in our body, in our fluids, in our everywhere in the body. IgA, on the other hand, will go. So let's say we talk about our mouth or nose or eyes or reproductive system or other mucosal surfaces, the wet surfaces of our body. So what I let's say there is this cell that is part of my mouth surface. So this cell will be covered, as we know, with lots of fluids, correct? That is how we are, our, these surfaces are wet. So let's say here, we have a layer of fluid in front of the cell. In this layer, we have IgA. There are secretory IgAs, these are antibodies that are present in this layer. And their function, so imagine this wet area of the mouth, the saliva of the mouth that is covering all of our mouth and the GIT and the eyes, the conjunctiva covered by tears and the nasal area covered by nasal secretions. All of those secretions have these IgAs present. Now, when the virus arrives, so let's say we're standing next to somebody who coughed and they had the virus and that virus entered our mouth. And now when the virus arrives, these IgAs are going to attack that virus and bind to it. Their function is number one, they're going to prevent that virus from entering our cell. So what they do is imagine if the IgA is like an arm. So what would happen is if this was the cell, IgA is going to bind with the cell like this and hold the virus here. So it would not let the virus access the cell and keep it away. That is one. Secondly, when the, when the wet surface moves along, we sometimes spit our saliva out or we swallow our saliva. So when the saliva moves away, it is going to wash the virus with it, which is still coated with IgA. Then when the virus is coated, with IgA, so let's say this is the virus's spike protein and it is coated with IgA, there can be 
complement activation, which is a set of proteins in our body, and I've done detailed discussions about it, the complement would become activated, and complement causes destruction of whatever is attached here. So now if I have become immunized and I am protected and the virus lands in my mouth, I have a mechanism to neutralize the virus or keep it away from my cells. Let's think about it this way now. Let's say there was enough of a dose of the virus that came into my mouth that when I talk back, it just flies back out and goes to somebody else's mouth. But now it is coated with IgA. So one, it is probably going to drop on the way, or even if it reaches the other person's mouth, it is now coated with the IgA. It is now going to be attacked by that person's immune system. It is not going to enter the blood, uh, the cells that easily. So ideally, a person who has become vaccinated is not contagious or less contagious. Now, from data, the answer is both Pfizer and Moderna said we have no data available to tell you if the person will not be contagious because to collect that data they would have to ask the person that who did he come in contact with did he became infected then did he transmit the infection to somebody else or they test everybody who the person came in contact with and to see if they got infected or not and then make sure that they became infected from this person so this all was very complex for them to uh, to track so they simply said, we do not know. So I, I have given you a technical answer that technically this should not happen or this should happen less. From a data point of view, they don't know. And then there was there was more questions here. So Susan uh, says, should we be concerned with these vaccines causing Guillain-Barre or exacerbating it? I have read in the past that the correlation between it and the flu vaccine. So the thing is this, any autoimmune disease can become exacerbated. Although so far the data shows that it actually helps and not cause the, their immune system to be triggered against other autoimmune areas. So they are actually saying that if you are autoimmune, as long as you are not hypersensitive, you don't have allergic reactions, other autoimmune diseases, they are recommending the vaccine to be given. <laughs> Are there really trolls? I don't even know. I am just busy with the discussions. Um, uh, I'm just trying to look for the questions. Questions appear and then they just scroll with the... <clears throat> Antonia says, is it okay to use ivermectin even for dogs since there is no available ivermectin for humans in our country? So Antonio, that is the thing. I have never recommended it, the animal um, ivermectin, because what I do not know, it is my ignorance. What I do not know is the composition of the thing. What are the substances in it? The testing of it, the difference from the dog's body and our body's response the dose present in it. So because I do not know all of those things, I cannot recommend it. Uh, so Marie says, why if masks are so effective against the transmission of COVID, were masks not recommended to be worn during early, every influenza season? People die from influenza too. So, Marie, it seems like you, uh, you're you coming from a little bit of a, a, a cynical point of view, but still, it would be great if we can give masks to folks with influenza as well. 
it would actually help them as well. And so this should not be, I when I used to work in uh, corporates, now I run my own business. I used to say that presence of one fault is not the justification of one more fault. So if you see something broken here, we should not use that as an example to say the next thing should be broken as well because this thing is broken. So not using masks with influenza does not mean that the mask doesn't work. If that was the case and the people who wear masks in the hospitals when they're working from ever in surgery, they would not wear masks. So masks have their utility. If we have, if we have neglected their use correctly, because maybe we cannot announce every winter season to say everyone start wearing masks, then that is our problem. But that is not a justification to apply to this pandemic. <laughs> so Wayne, good question. How come we can eat on an airplane three inches from the next guy, but can't eat six feet from someone in a restaurant? So ideally, no, this should not be the correct thing. Three inches from the next guy and or or the next guy who's sitting on the the seat in front of us where we are inhaling and exhaling and the vapor is going to travel to them as well. Although I have seen lots of uh, airplane uh, studies where they say that our HEPA filters are great and we suck the air and we clean it right away so the transmission is low. Then there are studies that show that airplane travel does not cause that much transmission. So now the answer to that could be it doesn't cause that much transmission because it generally does not cause that much transmission and six feet is just a silly rule. Or it could be that if you are actually facing each, each other and we are transmitting the virus and there is no flowing air, then that is more dangerous compared to if the air is flowing. So in the surgical theaters as well, there are airflow systems built in a way that they very quickly trap the air and take it away. That said, I am not comfortable with the air travel. So uh, Denise Kaya says, how were the vaccines brought out this quickly when previous vaccination vaccines have taken a significantly longer period of time to bring to market? Absolutely good question. A few parts of this answer. <clears throat> Number one, the whole world is stopped and everyone is working for a solution. For example, we could argue, why did we find ivermectin now that it is useful and not before? Why did we find hydroxychloroquine now that it is useful and not before? It has been out there for decades and we didn't know this. The reason is that we have become laser focused at this time to figure out the solution to this. The whole world. Have you ever seen anything in which the whole world, even non-medical people, we are all sitting here and discussing and people send me comments that, hey, I think we should do it this way. For example, there was a gentleman who sent me an idea of a, a product and I don't want to give it away because he wanted to do some uh, patenting on that as well. But that product was going to trap virus and then do something to it and then it would become actually useful. Th that was a great idea. Why did we not think of that before? So that is one, that one, every resource is being applied to find a solution, one. Second, previously we did not have this messenger RNAs available, the, the genetic material available for the virus so fast, two. Third, the Moderna type companies had been working on messenger RNA technologies for years. And they were able to look at the vaccine and quickly manufacture the messenger RNA. That is just advancement in the science at this time. And there are many, many more such reasons. So uh, saying that, for example, today we can travel from point A to B. I can go from my home to San Francisco in 40 minutes. I'm in Cupertino. So somebody argues with me and says, you know what, in 16th century, we would go from here to there in two days. How come you reach there and you say you can reach there in 40 minutes? 
then that is an incorrect analogy. Our world is not the same place at the same place where we used to be at decades ago. The technologies are different. The availability of testing is different. The look, the whole world is working on it. So good question, but the situation is different. So Marie, this is a very good question. So even after getting the vaccine and the booster, a person can still get ill, but not severely ill. Could he, she still end up with long COVID if he, she gets sick despite the vaccine? Good question. So yes, to your sec first part of the question that so far vaccines show that there is not, the severely ill part is blocked. So the immune system responds so quickly and so efficiently that a person can take care of the virus very quickly. One can become infected after the vaccine. And second is um, the long COVID part. So same answer that if we can effectively take care of the, the issue within one or two days, then our immune system does not go nuts. It does not become you know, all upset and long hauling situation should be improved too. The vaccine papers that I have actually read from FDA, um, from Pfizer and Moderna both, they both said we are not able to tell if the long hauling would occur or not because that needs more time to observe and we didn't have enough time to observe. So that may still be something to look at, but from a technical point of view, that should not happen because immune system's response will not be overwhelming. Okay, so <clears throat> there is a question. So somebody is saying back pain as a COVID symptom. So Yarab 1223, look, COVID can cause muscle weakness, and that can happen with any virus. And so that myalgia and tiredness can result in back pain as well. So it can happen, yes. So Arun says, can Denise's question answer be 20 countries, one year, two scientists? Probably? Yes, it's the same thing. That the whole world scientists are working on this. So this is from every country, there is some sort of a contribution. And of course, so you, you can do this kind of a math and say hundreds of years worth of research is done in this year. If just my videos, the watch time for my videos is 136 years long. Imagine the work time by humanity on this thing is how long. So uh, question, why they do not test the vaccine effectiveness with the antibody test? Very good question. That is because they don't want you to know if you got the placebo or the vaccine. So <laughs> those countries where these things are a little lax, I tell the person who goes for a vaccine trial, I tell them to get the antibody test and see if they actually developed it or not. Alex says, question, I see over time, years later, the messenger RNA causing autoimmune diseases because it will enter other cells besides APC, for example, enter neurons. So um, one, nobody has seen the future. If I go back to the SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV, there have been reports of some people after 10 years still having issues that they developed diabetes early or they developed cardiac problems early uh, in their age range compared, for example, if I am 30 and I got the infection and then I develop something at 40, which others would develop at 50 or later on. So th there is data on the actual infection causing people to become, to develop some chronic diseases early on. So the virus 
could hang out or the immune system response could persist for a longer time causing these things. But I am speculating because these are different viruses and this is different. One. Secondly, the mRNA from vaccine cannot live that long. So I discussed that a few days, days ago that can the vaccine continue to make spike proteins. In there, if you see, mRNAs are within hours, minutes to hours to days, they're destroyed. Our cells do not allow such things to stay in them forever. Our cells have much, much stronger regulatory mechanisms. So please watch that video. You would see that mRNA is destroyed very fast. <laughs> Zelena says, my husband has become a Dr. Bean Medical Lectures Uber doer. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, Rukhir Raju says, I recently got the vaccine, both doses. Will I know if it worked on me if I get tested for antibodies? Yes. And I would recommend getting tested earlier after the second dose within 10 days or so, so your antibody titers are still high. Eventually, within another month or so, these titers would go down because your memory cells are going to go to sleep. When they are challenged by an actual virus again, then they would rise up and they would start making uh, antibodies again. So if you are going to get yourself tested, do it within the 7, 10 days of the second dose. <clears throat> so some more questions on the Twitter side as well. Twitter folks are going to become upset that I didn't respond to many of their questions. I think tomorrow we'll continue with this open forum and we'll discuss Twitter as well. So are the government health officials, so K-pop super strong, health officials even reading medical journals or preprint research about ivermectin or aviptadil why are we still stuck on the standard care? Antibody treatment and remdesivir. I hope for these three breakthroughs will help us. JNJ vaccine, which I just talked about it. Ivermectin and Aviptadil. So K-pop super strong. Yes, you are correct. I have discussed Aviptadil before, discussed Ivermectin a lot, and JNJ, I just discussed it today. Ideally, these things should actually help. And these things... Uh, hydroxychloroquine, quercetin, zinc, melatonin, vitamin D, vitamin C, all of those are actually useful. You are correct. Um, uh, it seems like it is a rhetorical statement that are they listening to? They're not listening to it. They, I don't think they care for this that much. So your point is correct, but unfortunate that they're not doing it. Irish Kriya Yogi says, can you watch this video? So I looked at this video. <clears throat> this is about the H5N1 pandemic. And so somebody just uploaded this video as well that we are going to have another pandemic soon. Uh, Irish, I don't think that that is um, yet uh, possible or it's going, I, I can't tell the future. So this is a future looking forward kind of a video to say this is going to happen. I can't yet comment. Nick. Petroni says, Dear Dr. Mubin, why are dead bodies of COVID-19 patients dangerous and for how many years must remain buried? Very good question. So let's talk about it in a more technical way. Look, <clears throat> what happens is when a person dies, there are some cells that are going to stay. So when a person dies, there are, of course, the virus needs cells, correct? Virus needs to be able to get into the cell. Then it needs the cell's machinery to work. It needs the nucleus to function. It needs the, the, the channels to work and so on. It needs a healthy living cell to continue to function. Now what happens is when we die, our cells die in various um, stages. For example, our death simply means that the neuronal systems are not working or the liver is not working or the lungs are not working or the heart is not working. So these are immediately dead. But as you know that our nails continue to grow for days or our hair keep becoming long for days after dying. 
So there are still some cells in which there may be some function going on and the virus can actually use them. So the dead body is dangerous because as you are handling it, it can actually emit the virus, one from the person's lungs, for example, or from the person's GIT system, or, or from their mouth, or from their anus, or from their bodily secretions, there would be contamination present. And if a person died of COVID, almost all of their secretions would have the virus in it. So because of that, they're very contagious because imagine how much damage had occurred in them, how much spread of the virus had occurred in them that they died. So because of that, they are dangerous. But once their cells have died, and that would take, let's say, 10, 11 days, all the body cells are gone. Now the virus has no cell to live on. It cannot just graze on a cell and eat it. It needs a functioning cell. So by that time, the virus is gone as well. So the virus RNA, and this is a SARS-CoV-2, is an enveloped virus. That means it has a membrane around this, and it needs that membrane to stay hydrated. To, to stay viable. So the virus is going to die with the cells when they die. So 10, 11 days and so, and the virus is gone. So it doesn't mean for years, it's just a few days. Uh, positive news, what is driving severe response in some young males still? Are we still not sure of protocol? Does vitamin D alone can inform severity in some young right BMI males? So, <clears throat> Once again, we are not very much sure how the cytokine storm occurs, but you are correct. If I extend your second part of the question or the statement that vitamin D levels, vitamin D, vitamin C, K2, zinc, melatonin, um, then the other supports, they can actually make a lot of difference. And when we at a national level or international level are not talking about those things and not saying how to help with them, then, of course, people keep getting victim, fall victim to this. So um, let me answer one more part. Are we not sure of the protocol? We are actually sure of the protocol. We are not using the protocol because it is not getting approved. And so because of that, doctors and others, look, even if a doctor does uh, prescribe ivermectin, many times pharmacy declines it. So this is, I feel that people are, caged and they are not allowed to get out. That is what's happening. And it's a problem with the medical leadership. So we are at 747. I think I'm going to stop here with the Twitter. Uh, and from Henry Fortuin and onwards, I would answer tomorrow. I'm going to look at the um, I'm going to look at the uh, discussion here. So let's see. Yeah, so Rima, for example, I must plus is a great protocol. I have been discussing various things as well. So one can actually easily formulate that what needs to be done from there. So yes, there are protocols and easily available solutions. <clears throat> so Sonja says, long hauler, daily feel sick and not well generally suggestions. Sonja, has your doctor given you a uh, pulse of uh, steroids? Correct. So uh, as as Plouf Monkey says that uh, cremation is standard burial practice in India, so that helps as well. So this question about the Pfizer vaccine and deaths, I am going to actually look into that and do a separate discussion. <laughs> uh, Margaret says we should have camped them. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so <laughs> uh, for me, everyone is welcome. Somebody who is trolling, somebody who is cursing, they are still welcome because I feel they may listen to something that would help them. And uh, that is the belief. If I was more looking at 
I would only talk if you are going to respect me or if you are going to be nice to me, then I would have stopped talking a long time ago. So Anthony says, long haulers, check out Dr. Matthew Cook on YouTube and Spotify, Apple Pod, treating severe long haulers, IV ozone, IV NAD+, IV vitamin C, thymosine alpha-1, same as he does for lime mold, etc. So thank you very much, Anthony. How are you doing? I know that you are going through this as well. <clears throat> cool. So how about we stop for today? There is one more question and then we stop and then we'll continue this thing tomorrow as well because there are lots of questions on Twitter that are left. Uh, William Goff says, question, I know you said ivermectin will not interfere with the mRNA vaccine, but will ivermectin interfere with the adenovirus based vaccine? Very good question. And let me draw it and explain it. Short answer is no. And let me give a more, uh, a longer question, longer answer. So <clears throat> here is what happens. So let's say here we have a cell and the cell has ivermectin in it, right? So I make ivermectin like a Superman. The function of the ivermectin, one of the function, uh, ivermectin does a lot of things, but one of the function of the ivermectin is that when the virus, virus, not the vaccine, when the virus comes into our cell, it releases some of its enzymes that need to be carried to the nucleus to reduce the defense of the nucleus and reduce the production of interferons. That strips down the cell from defending itself and from telling the neighboring cells to shore up their defenses. And that is how the virus just keeps moving forward. When ivermectin is present, this virus's cargo is disrupted by ivermectin and it cannot enter the nucleus. Now, when we give a vaccine, so let's say vaccine is messenger RNA or vaccine is uh, adenovirus. The adenovirus we saw yesterday, its job, once it is inside the cell, is to break down and then attach whatever are the remnants. It's like a broken, clunky virus that kind of drags all the way by kinesin-1, is dragged by kinesin-1 and attached to the nucleus, nucleopore. Over there, it directly injects the DNA it is carrying for uh, spike protein into the nucleus. This process is not the same as the important alpha and beta cargo in going into the cell. And I've done a big discussion about it, I think four or five times. That's why I'm not spending too much time on it. But the blockade by ivermectin is for a very different kind of a protein in the cytoplasm. And the adenovirus connects directly with the nucleus and injects the DNA in there. So there is going to be no interference. So I hope that that answers that question. And um, thank you very much for today. <clears throat> we, will, we will continue our discussion tomorrow. I, there are so many questions, which are good questions on Twitter that needs to be done. At the end of this, we, we sat together for two hours. Thank you very much for your time. Um, if your question on the live stream are left, please um, bring those back tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> so there's a question from Evan. Dr. Bean, if a pregnant woman was allowed to be vaccinated, would the child also be protected for some number of years? So the study showed that the pregnant women who became infected, they were able to send the in antibodies into the child. And the antibodies in the child usually can live in them in the child anywhere from a couple of weeks to six months, but not beyond that because antibodies have an age as well. So the child will be protected for some months or for some weeks for sure, but not more than that. Because mother does not transmit the virus, she only donates the antibodies to the child. 
eventually the child has to make their own antibodies because the virus did not enter the child to train their immune system to make antibodies. So um, let's wind up for today. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, please like, subscribe, and share. I know that it is difficult to share these long videos, but <laughs> be courageous and share them. Maybe somebody can use uh, the, the knowledge in here. And there is a link in the description for coffees. If you would like to buy me a coffee, please use that. Under that link, there is another link for the support as well. So if you wanted to support my work too, please use that. And thank you very much. I would see you tomorrow.